Good evening and welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andy Cahan and I am pleased to introduce our guests. Using gorgeous, compassionate prose to continue our national conversation about people working together to heal our communities, Dolan Perkins Valdez is the author of the New York Times bestselling novels Wench and Balm. She has been a finalist for two NAACP Image Awards, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, and the Robert Olin Butler Fiction Award. And she won the 2011 First Novelist Award from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. The current chair of the board of the Penn Faulkner Foundation, she teaches creative writing at American University in Washington, DC. In Take My Hand, inspired by real life events, Perkins Valdez tells the story of Sybil Townsend, a black doctor who seeks justice for wrongs done to her patients decades before in 1970s Alabama. Tonight, she'll be in conversation with Philly's own Asali Solomon, author of the novels Disgruntled and Days of Afrikit. Asali teaches fiction writing and literature of the African diaspora at Harvard College. Please join me in welcoming Dolan Perkins Valdez and Asali Solomon to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Welcome out of your houses. I'm glad you could join us tonight. Um, so I will, I'll be talking to um, Dolan and then um, you guys can ask your questions. So first of all, I wanted to congratulate you on Take My Hand. Thank you. It's an amazing accomplishment. Thank um, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I really enjoyed the characters. Um, although, you know, the story is, Sad, as you know. Yeah. Um, but what I wanted to ask you, first thing I wanted to ask you is, what keeps drawing you to historical fiction? Well, first of all, thank you for doing this tonight, right. Asali. I know this is uh, time away from your family, but I'm so happy you're here. Um, you know, I keep getting drawn to these stories that I think need to be told. I feel like there's still so many stories that people don't know about, mm -hmm. and. Um, I love history. I mean, I that's I like to read historical fiction. I like to read history books. Um, I remember years ago um, giving a presentation, and when I was, uh, you know, trying to be an academic, and uh, my academic papers were always very historical. I tried to get into a historian's class when I was a graduate student, and he told me that I hadn't done the prerequisites. And so I couldn't get into the class. So I never took a graduate course in history, but I liked it and my feelings were hurt <laughs> that he didn't let me in that class. And um, I remember giving this academic paper and apologizing the whole time that I wasn't a trained historian because it was like I had given the paper of a historian. I was over there in their discipline playing around. <laughs> And, um, and this historian came up to me, uh, a professor at UCLA by the name of Scott Brown, um, and he came up to me and he said, you should stop doing that. And I said, stop doing what? He said, you should stop apologizing for not being a historian. And uh, I said, but I'm not. And he said, no, you are. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I never forgot that. You know, it was, very, it was very nice of him to say that because I was intimidated by that room. <laughs> Um, but I have just learned over the years, and thank you guys for clapping. I have I have learned over the years that that's what I like, and um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what do you want to tell us about the origins of this book for you? Like where the idea came from, how it came together for you as a story. You know, I feel like I have been learning about these girls forever. I had read about them, I would watch a documentary and there they would be, you know, there was, there's all this archival footage of the girls, of uh, the Ralph sisters, um, uh, Mary Alice and Minnie Lee Ralph, and I would think about that case. I remember hearing when women in the state of North Carolina were trying to get reparations for the sterilizations that occurred there. And I think in my mind, I thought the book had been written, mm. you know? Um, mm. 
And so I began to um, dig a little bit deeper one day, just thinking about them. And I realized that nobody had written about them and nobody had really written about black women being sterilized. Mm -hmm. There had been books about, you know, there were some white women who were sterilized as well, poor white women, but nobody had written about that I know of. And maybe somebody here knows a book that I don't. And um, I just began to think, let me just see what this is all about. I always start with just my curiosity, mm -hmm. just digging. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I don't know if it's going to come of anything. I go down 15 rabbit holes mm -hmm. before a book is born. And um, I just remember um, digging around and thinking, this is interesting. Um, this is terrible. This is outrageous. But it didn't become a book until I was looking in old newspaper accounts, the Montgomery Advertiser, and when the original lawsuit was filed, it was filed against the clinic that sterilized those sisters, and it also named the supervising nurse. And there was a quote in the newspaper where that supervising nurse, who was a white woman, had said, well, it must have been okay because all eight nurses who worked at the clinic were black, she said. And uh, I said, what? I mean, you know, like in my mind, I'm thinking, wait, what, what? But I, it made sense to me because they put these family planning clinics in black neighborhoods and the you know, easiest way to penetrate a black neighborhood is to put people in the clinic who look like us. Mm -hmm. But I never found anything about those nurses. I don't, to this day, I don't know their names. I don't know anything about them. All I know is that my imagination caught fire. Mm -hmm. And I started to wonder, what would it have been like to be a nurse working at that clinic, a black woman nurse, and have something like this happen under your watch? And how do you live with yourself? Mm -hmm. um, and that's when the, that's when civil was born in my mind. Mm -hmm. So, like, there's a line here. It says, "She says I had never known that good intentions could be just as destructive as bad ones." Right? She says that at some point. Just tell me a little bit about that line and the book, because I feel like that's really at the heart. A big. That's one of the things at the heart of the book. Yes. Just that. Yes, just how does something that you intend to do good end up being so bad, so horrible? Um, you know, both you and I teach, uh, and I remember when I was um, reading about how I needed to care for my students and how, what was my responsibility to my students as a, as a professor, and I remember reading one time that where, and I don't even remember who I was reading, said, um, unintentionally wounding your students is still wounding them, right? <clears throat> yeah. And I never forgot that. I always think carefully when I'm in the classroom mm -hmm. about how I'm caring for my students. Mm -hmm. um, I try never to speak flippantly. I don't joke that much with them, about them at their expense, mm -hmm. because I understand that you can wound people. And so I thought a lot about Sybil in this book and her unintentional woundings. Um, of course, for her, it goes even beyond, you know, sterilization. Right. It is in how she stops listening to the family, for example. It's in how she makes assumptions about what the family even needs. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the things I was thinking about was when we are trying to do good work, when we're trying to do, um, for lack of a better word, charitable work, that it's really important for us to know that we don't have all the answers. And that is something that Sybil has to learn, that she doesn't have all the answers. Um, but at one point she, she says, I marched right up into that house five foot, I forget, five foot five inches of know-it-all, she <laughs> said. And uh, when I was young, growing up, uh, my mother used to say, you think you know everything and don't know nothing, when she was <laughs> fussing at me. 
And um, and that's civil. She thinks she knows everything and don't know nothing, as the old folks would say. And so she knows something. What she knows is that something has to be done. What she doesn't know is that um, it's not all in her hands, mm -hmm. that there are some forces working that are larger than her. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I really, I really have thought a lot about that unintentional wounding. And in the case of these girls, um, in the case of civil, I think there were some, you know, unintentional things happening. But in the case of the U.S. government, yeah. I'm less charitable. That's not unintentional. I don't think so. <laughs> no. I mean, but speaking about civil again, it's kind of interesting because her own life is sort of unresolved and sort of disordered. And so she takes a very different attitude with these people, almost as if she can has more power or something over their lives than the things that are so unresolved in hers. But um, so how do you, what are some ways that you are able to create a world that you didn't live in? Like in terms of 1973 Montgomery as like a conscious person, like how do you create these distant historical moments in a way that makes you feel like, okay, I've, I've achieved this, this is authentic. I'm not sure I do. I mean, <laughs> it's so funny because when I first started writing this book, I didn't think it was historical fiction. I thought I was writing a contemporary novel because my first two books were set in the 1800s. And when I think of historical fiction, I think of World War II and right. earlier, just in my mind. Yeah. And, um, but I remember my teenager said to me, my 15 year old um, said, you mean way back in the 1900s? <laughs> And she's like, you know, she said, that is historical fiction, mama. And I was like, what are you saying? I mean, I'm me born right in now? 73, so oh, yeah, no. I mean, it was a while ago. But. It's a while ago, but we yeah. were alive. I know, it's true. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I didn't think it was historical fiction, but I will tell you, like, writing this book taught me um, that I did need to do some work mm -hmm. to, to, to move back into 1973. I needed to figure out, I needed to... I, I listened to people um, on recordings from Alabama during that period, country people. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I smooth things a lot. They don't talk exactly like country people would have talked. But I looked for words that I could use, mm -hmm. um, the language of Alabama during that time, a lot of the references in the book. I had to research the music, um, places they would have gone to eat, mm -hmm. uh, the old highway that, or the expressway that was built that cut through the black business district and destroyed it. Um, there were a lot of things that needed that I needed in order to give shape to this moment. Mm -hmm. And I learned, I just had a student come in and she has a book set in 1994 and she said, that's not really historical. And I said, oh, but it is. Yeah, really, I mean, <laughs> well, just also because things have changed so rapidly in like so the past rapidly. 20 or 30 years that, that's right. you know, there's no cell, you know, you wouldn't really have a cell phone in that book. That is exactly what I said, Asali. So, that is yeah. exactly what I said. Yeah. I said there that, you know, 1994, there were no cell phones really. Okay. And I said- The and internet wasn't really- The I mean, internet was just, was just yeah. we had AOL, I think, yeah. in 1994. Yeah, you, can, you still you listen could, to your modem power up I you did it was dial yeah. up yeah uh-huh and so the rise of cell phones and personal computing really yeah. changed our lives in right. in dramatic ways so that that's one of the things that this book taught me that I couldn't underestimate you know what was historical and what needed to research and I feel that if you know even for this student writing this book in 1994 she's a wonderful writer I have no doubt she can do it but she's going to have to research how a person really thought about the world at mm. that time. Yeah. You know. Yeah, she's going to have to research what it's like to take a phone call and talk on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> The students right. don't or know, call waiting they, they have no idea about yeah call yeah waiting just like communication was a totally different or a long distance call that's right remember that you had to pay my um, mother still says that i'm on the phone long distance <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just she's paying still. paying for every minute yeah um so i'm glad you said your mother because this book is really about a lot of it is about mothers and daughters right the whole book is framed as a sort of a lot of it is a, like a letter almost to Sybil's daughter. And there's also, she has a really fascinating relationship with her mother. Talk about these themes of mothers and daughters in the book and 
I don't know, just some of your thoughts about that and how you, that came into the story for you. Well, in, and of course, this also goes back to the first question you asked me about the origins of the story, because, um, you know, you and I are both mothers, and when you think of something like this happening to anyone's child, but, you know, let alone to your own child, it makes something in you just want to, you know. Uh, when I spoke with, uh, I spoke with um, the social worker, Mrs. Jessie Bly, who was the real life person who discovered what had happened to the girls. They did have a, so in the book they don't have a social worker, in mm -hmm. real life they do. And her name is Mrs. Jessie Bly, and mm -hmm. she told me that when she discovered those girls had been sterilized, she said, I just saw bulls behind my eyes. Those were mm -hmm. her exact words to me, she saw bulls. And uh, I get that, I understand that, because as a mother, the thought of something like this happening makes me see bulls, you know? Um, I couldn't have put it better myself. And so I entered the book with that feeling of outrage. Now in the book, my girls um, don't have a mother. Mm -hmm. And that was intentional on my part. In real life, the Ralph sister's mother was there and alive mm -hmm. and very well, but in my book, I, did, I wanted to remove that level of protection mm -hmm. for them to further emphasize their vulnerability. They're different from the Ralph sisters in that my, my girls in my book are younger. They're 11 and 13. The Ralph sisters were 12 and 14. In my book, they, their mother is deceased. And also, um, the younger sister, India, has not started her cycle yet, which we learn very early in mm -hmm. the second or third chapter. But they've put her on birth control. Right. And I don't know if that's true for the actual Ralph sister, but I wanted, that came to me as I was drafting the book, I wanted, I was doing everything I could to communicate to the reader that these were just children. That may have been true in real life, I don't know. I'm sure there were girls that were put on birth control who, you know, they right. just never asked. Somebody right. asked me the other day, like, why did they put her on there? And I said, I don't think they asked, I think they assumed. And I think black children, um, black girls and black boys are often um, perceived to be older than they are, yeah. when in fact they're just children. And so uh, I wanted to emphasize that as a mother, that these were just vulnerable children. And, um, and the other thing in terms of Sybil and her mother, so Sybil is in a, a sort of upper middle class black family. Her father is a doctor. Her mother is an artist, a painter. And they live on Centennial Hill in Montgomery, Alabama. They lived, I mean, Sybil has her, she got a car, a new car for graduation, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the Williams family, uh, they don't have a mother. Uh, they are dirt poor. Mm -hmm. And the grandmother is there in the home, but she's kind of checked out a little bit um, at the beginning of the book. She has lost her ability to mother the girls. And... Um, I wanted to kind of juxtapose these families to show that even if you have both parents in the home, it isn't necessarily perfection, right? Mm -hmm. The father works all the time, the mother suffers from depression, uh, undiagnosed depression, mm -hmm. untreated depression. And so I wanted to also juxtapose this notion and, and, and actually kind of just poke a hole in this notion that you know the nuclear black middle class family is somehow inherently better. Mm -hmm. Because so often, um, you know, black families that don't have that model, whether it be a single parent household or another type of uh, household structure have been villainized. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to show that, you know, we all have our things we deal with in our families. And uh, that was really important. Mm -hmm. And in fact, civil, you know, yearns for her mother's love. She yearns right. for a mother's love. Um, so yeah, that is one of the sort of layers of the book. So <laughs> all, I feel like all historical fiction is basically, you know, about now in some way, right? So I don't know, how do you think about this book in terms of it being a, a way of also commenting on certain con or on contemporary circumstances? That's a really good question. You know, somebody asked me a similar question t to that about 
you know, what do I feel is the real, like their straightforward answer to that is people are still getting sterilized. Women in California state prisons are still getting sterilized. Mm -hmm. And there is a current fight right now Mm -hmm. to compensate those women who have been sterilized and to stop this from happening. You know, we, we know that a whistleblower has alleged that immigrant women are being sterilized in detention facilities. That's my straightforward answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But my roundabout answer to that question has to do with how I think about the contemporary moment in relation to historical fiction. And I often think of, you know, every historical novel has a relationship to the past that represents, right? So if you read Margaret Walker's Jubilee, which was a historical novel published in the 1970s, that book has a particular 197, I forget Mm -hmm. what year it was published, was it 74 or something like that? Uh, has a particular 1970-something perspective right. on the 19th century. Yeah. Even when we think of, you know, Beloved, right, probably the greatest historical novel of all times, has a particular, uh, what was that, 1987? 87. Relationship with mm-hmm. that history. Right. And um, so I've, and I even think about my first book, which was published 12 years ago, Winch, We've moved beyond, even now we refer, we don't use the word slave master, we say enslavers. We don't Mm -hmm. use the word slaves, we say enslaved people. Mm -hmm. So even our language around um, enslavement has Mm -hmm. changed since I published that book 12 years ago. So I often uh, wonder like how my books will age as we continuously evolve in our perspective on the past. Mm -hmm. And so I think every historical novel has a contemporary perspective Mm -hmm. on what it's representing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought a lot about this just, you know, in in an atmosphere, I think, where, you know, we certainly have heard a lot in the last couple of years about black people's distrust of sort of the American American medical establishment, right? Mm -hmm. And that kind of thing, which was very, which has been dangerous recently, this distrust. But also um, just the fight over reproductive rights and reproductive justice. I mean, this is a different kind of thinking about that. But that's, you know, I thought a lot about that. Well, and I think with the Supreme Court decision coming out in June, which is going to gut Roe v. Wade. I mean, there's just no question about it. Um, And that gutting of Roe v. Wade is going to affect black women in ways that are going to be devastating, right? right? And also, um, I will say that um, even if your issue is not around that form of reproductive liberty and reproductive Mm -hmm. justice, um, there are also things that we need to be thinking about as black women in the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Are are our needs being heard? when we go to see the doctor, right. do they see us? Do they, are they able, you know, does your doctor even look you in the eye? Mm-hmm. You know, um, in my uh, book launch in DC, you know, of course it was the first night the book came out and nobody had read it yet. Mm-hmm. We ended up having a discussion about what it means to find a doctor who sees you mm-hmm. and how difficult that is and how important it is that we encourage young people to go to medical school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're still looking at like less than 2% of all physicians in this country are black women. Mm -hmm. That has to change. Yeah. And I mean, then you have things like the high maternal maternal mortality rate. That's right. What was the hardest thing to write in the book or the hardest thing to do when you were writing this book? Oh, I guess I think the hardest thing was trying to make sure I did justice to the Williams family. Mm-hmm. I, I got civil. I understood civil. Civil came to me and never left me and was just like right here in my head. And it's mm-hmm. like, this is what you're going to write. And this is what you're going to do. And this is what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like I had no problem with her, but I had to really get quiet. Mm-hmm. to uh, try to write Mace, mm-hmm. the girl's father, and to try to write the girls and to make sure they were heard. Mm-hmm. I had to really um, ask people about 
representing a character with a disability mm -hmm. yeah. and making sure that I did that justice. And, and one of my friends said to me, just make sure you don't cure her, mm -hmm. quote unquote, right. at the end of the book. Like that's, that would be a terrible error, this notion of quote unquote curing uh, someone. And so it was just very important to me that I represented India with dignity and with humanity and with, you know, she's, she's still, you know, a child. She loves dolls and she loves dogs and she, you know, loves to be out on the playground like any other kid, mm -hmm. you know, and she loves to play with toys and, you know, she has her favorite foods. And so that to me was the most challenging part was making sure I gave honor to that family. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole book is Sybil sort of telling this story to her daughter. Like, what do you, what do you think her daughter will say? <laughs> what does she want her daughter to get out of it, do you think? You know, I think her daughter in, is really the reader. Mm -hmm. And for, for me, I, I feel that, you know, I'm a, I grew up in Memphis, you know, and I feel that my parents' generation didn't look to us for forgiveness or anything mm -hmm. like that. They didn't look for us to give them anything. That just isn't something they do mm -hmm. or did or mm -hmm. do. <laughs> yeah, right. But they often shared their wisdom with us. And they, you know, when I was growing up on Sundays, the elders spoke. You know, you listen to their stories. Um, and I heard so many stories during just Sunday dinner. Mm -hmm. And I feel that she's just sharing her wisdom. Her daughter in the book is the same age that she was when this happened. She's on the verge of retiring. She's making this trip, mm -hmm. you know, and she needs to be honest, she feels, with her daughter. But I don't think she's looking for any kind of absolution or anything like that. I think she is um, passing it along in the same way that I'm passing it along to the reader. Mm -hmm. What the reader does with it, I don't know what the reader does with this mm -hmm. book. You know, I've long ago lost in a sense of thinking I can control anybody or anything that happens. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, at the very least, hope you, you read it and think mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think she's doing with her daughter. Just at least hear me. Mm -hmm. So I have time for one more question okay. for me and then we're gonna okay. talk to the audience. But the flip side of that question is, I mean, this is a very, there are aspects of the story that are kind of unrelievedly tragic. Like what happens with the Williams sisters is just, you know, when it happens, you just, I felt such a sense of visceral loss, you know, but what were some sort of things you really enjoyed or brought you joy in like writing the story? What were some characters you liked seeing on the page and mm. moments that you enjoyed? Well, I love the 1970s, don't you? I mean, I feel like I'm just a <laughs> child of the 70s. I love, you know, I've got references to Booker T and the MGs. They go to the bowl game, the classic bowl game mm -hmm. uh, with Alabama State. They, um, I loved just um, being in Montgomery on a summer day. A lot of the book mm -hmm. takes place during the summer where, when it's beautiful but hot in mm -hmm. Alabama. They go to the beach. They mm -hmm. go down to oh, the yeah. beach in one of the scenes. Um, there's a lot of radio music, uh, you know, stopping at the filling station, as we used to call it. There's... Um, Food. Uh, I was listening to the audio book, and I love the audio book narrator. Y'all have got to listen to her. Her name is Lauren Daggett. And she said he was eating a bologna sandwich. And I love that she said that, a bologna sandwich, because that's exactly how we said it. We didn't say bologna. You know, we said bologna. Wait, do people say bologna? Some people say bologna. Bologna. Oh, bologna. Nobody says bologna? No. I mean, bologna? No. I've heard people say bologna. Yeah. We said bologna. She said he was bologna. eating a bologna sandwich. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I just thought, uh, just going back into the 1970s was fun. I like the 1970s mm -hmm. and I was thinking maybe I'll write another 1970s book, although I don't know if that'll happen, but yeah, that, that was fun to me and just having that nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you do that again, then it'll be less research up front. I hope so. <laughs> You're already I hope put so. in some of that research. Um, questions. Um, in your research, did you find anything that indicated that those black nurses knew what was happening? I never found the nurses. 
Okay. I never found any other reference to them. I never found their names. I looked, I couldn't find anything. Excuses, but it, it's possible that they could not have known. Just because you're in a place mm -hmm. working doesn't, know, doesn't mean that you know everything. I mean, you could be at your job yes. and not know everything that's happening. So that's why I asked. Well, question. I'll tell you this, in the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, Eunice Rivers knew. She knew that some of those men were given placebos and were not actually being treated. I was always curious about Eunice Rivers and why we didn't, ex you know, hmm. huh? We, well, history's been sort of kind to her. And, and one of the things that I found is that people said she was following orders, and I kind of tried to incorporate that, that she, she trusted the federal government and she trusts, you know, this was not a secret. They were publishing in the major medical journals about what was going on in the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. So I tried to incorporate that with my nurses, that they trust that the federal government is trying to do what's right. The federal government was, it was a good job. It was a powerful entity. And this went all the way to the White House. You know, this was uh, a period in which, um, People either were radicalized and distrusted the federal government or they trusted them. It just depended on which side of that line you were on. So I believe that it's possible that some of them knew. I will tell you that the lawyer in real life who argued the case, Joseph Levin, um, told me that the same doctor who sterilized those girls was the same doctor who delivered him as a baby, who delivered him. I mean, this was a respected community doctor. It was, you know, out in the open. But when Mrs. Bly discovered what had happened to the Ralph sisters, she says that she went to, her husband was in the military, and she went to her husband's commanding officer and said, I must do something. What do I do? And he recommended this young civil rights lawyer in town, Joe mm -hmm. Levin. And she said she went to his office and she sat there and waited for him all day until he came back. So, um, you know, I, I can't really speak for those nurses. I'm hoping maybe on book tour one of them, because all these people are still alive. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that one of them will come to me. But I'm not tr really trying to indict anyone in real life. I am asking a question about a particular moment and how, because even if you weren't a nurse at the clinic, um, I mean, think about it. What are we doing right now? You know, like we all have to look inward and ask ourselves, are we doing enough? So it's not really fair for any of us to stand in judgment of anyone else. So I'm not trying to do that with those nurses. Okay. What are you reading right now? What am I reading? Well, I just got to reading this book that's coming out in May uh, that A.J. Verdell, I don't know if y'all remember oh. her, has a new book oh, coming wow. out called Miss Chloe. It's a memoir, mm -hmm. and it is about her friendship with Toni Morrison because, you know, Toni Morrison's first name was Chloe. Oh. And it is a beautiful book. It comes out May 12th or something like that, mm -hmm. and I just highly recommend it. A.J. Verdell wrote a book called The Good Negress. Oh, that was a long a time ago. long yeah. time ago in the 80s. That was a classic and um, and this is her first book in years, and I am so proud of her, and I got a chance to read an early copy. I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. And it was just wonderful to see Toni Morrison as a, as a girlfriend, as a friend, you know. We don't often see the queen like that, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, thank you for coming. Um, you. I have a question, and I have not read your book. I just bought it's it right fine. out there yeah. because I was so excited that you were coming, and that last book I read was Winch, so okay. I know nothing about it. Thank you for it. coming. Thank you. Other than what you shared, so if my question... No spoilers, I promise. Okay. We didn't do any spoilers <laughs> okay. today. Uh, if my question doesn't align, let me know. You keep referencing the girls, so my question is, when you were writing, were you trying to reach a younger audience at any time? Because I know it's historical, but... I don't know how much is written about the girls, mm -hmm. but were you ever think, did you ever have that age group in mind when you were writing? Well, 
even if I did, my kids are uncensored readers. So <laughs> I'm not very good at gauging what other people's kids are allowed to read. So I don't, I, would, I wouldn't say I had a younger reader in mind, but I feel that a younger reader could read this book. I don't know. Would you let your kids read? No. High school? I mean, I actually, I mean, I would. I don't know. I mean, my kids would be like, where are the dragons? <laughs> I know. I asked, <laughs> my seven-year-old came to the book of it, and I asked her, what did you think about it? And she said, complicating. Yeah, I mean, word. my kids wouldn't, you know, but yes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, it's, I don't, I feel like it's, they could, but it certainly is written more so that adults can get more out of it, I think, than kids would. Yeah, I don't really think about, I mean, I'm my own reader in that way. I'm writing for what I want to read, but um, no, no, but I, I, I don't know. If somebody classified it as another category out, I, of literature, I wouldn't, I'd be fine with that. Hi, Dolan. Thanks Hi. for coming. So Odessa. Ah, yes, I thought that was you. <laughs> um, we know each other from D.C. Um, <laughs> uh, do you have a, a, a thought um, on your next book yet? A thought is about what I have. Okay. I mean, it's okay. I have a, a manuscript that is in a mess right now. Wait, you have a book? You're like, I have a thought. You have a whole manuscript? I mean, it's, I would, it's not a whole manuscript. It's like messy pages. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of messy pages mm -hmm. is what I have. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Yes, um, thank you. To, I'm curious about the extent to which you accept yourself or your work as, as political. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I... I assume it is, as, as like as I guess as everything is political. But to what extent, even as a, as a professor, as a teacher, as a writer, to what extent you see yourself as like participating in a political conversation? That is a really good question. Do I know you? <laughs> you look familiar. I know you. Okay, you ask me these hard questions. That's okay. It's good. It's good. It's a good question. I'm glad you asked this. Uh, I will say that I am asking questions that I have. And my questions come from a certain viewpoint. And I would definitely say my fiction has a viewpoint because I am asking questions out of a need for answers that I don't have, that I need. Answers that I think this country needs. Questions to me that need to be asked. But in ter I, I can't say fully that I'm a political writer because I don't know what people will do. I don't, I think politics actually should make change, right? I think political actions should enact some kind of ultimately policy change, right? I come from DC, that's how we think. And I don't think my books are making that kind of difference. You know, like people read it, hopefully it changes your mind about something, hopefully it, you know, inspires somebody, but I can't say that my books are changing anything, you know? I think, um, so, it was, you know, I think if I were to say that I were a political writer, that would be to suggest that I was engaged in a political project with an end of some sort. But um, it's fiction. It's, it's, to me, I feel that fiction has the, ch the power to touch hearts and to change minds. But I don't know that fiction changes policy. But I could be wrong. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It's, we rarely make those direct links in society. Like rarely, I mean, I know that like, you know, Toni Morrison got the Presidential Medal of Freedom and I know that other artists do and I know that a lot of musicians, I know, um, I know that like, you think about music, you think about Stevie Wonder or Nina Simone or, or, or these other musicians. Uh, even if you think of an actor like Sidney Poitier, I've, I feel that maybe those types of, uh, artistic representations, because they occurred at a certain moment, because they were played in certain contexts, um, they might have had some kind of actual effect. I'm not sure that me writing in 2022 is doing the same work that they, that they were doing, but 
that's why that's a hard question because I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I'm glad you asked it, though. Do you think literature, Asali, has the power to... Yeah, definitely. But I, I think the, the confusing thing, I think, about our contemporary era is what is considered political, mm. right? Like, so a book like yours, I don't... I feel like any debate around forced sterilization is pretty much a, <laughs> a settled debate. Mm -hmm. But I think that, like, you know, there's... There is definitely like a political act, I think, in sort of rescuing stories from relative obscurity, rescuing stories of <clears throat> black oppression and resistance from relative obscurity, right? Mm -hmm. There is a kind of, you know, I think there is something that goes with that. Um, but I don't, but I don't, I mean, I don't know about what's, what's you know what's useful about thinking about us political it is political but i don't i don't think it's political in a sort of debatable or controversial way mm -hmm. in a sense so. hey how's it going hi ahmed how, how are, are you, you? I'm great. yay y'all this is my classmate from college <laughs> this is fantastic thank you so much yay well um actually in responding to the the comments of is this political or not there are others who are deciding for us whether our books and our literature are political. So even though we in this room may not say this is a political novel, there are others who are throwing our literature into the arena of politics. Mm. And so to that end, it, it is. But I would mm -hmm. say that any opportunity that someone has to inform um, and to perhaps uh, change minds is an opportunity to affect politics, even if it's not drafted as specifically a political book. I, I guess, tend to think that like politics is everything. Mm -hmm. um, so even though you, you may not consider this a political novel, um, others are deciding that our literature and our art are mm -hmm. political. So I would say it, there's mm -hmm. probably part of it that is. That's so interesting. And you know, the young people, uh, Ahmed is at Princeton, um, and I'm sure you've seen this um, with the students there. Um, a lot of the young people uh, are into social justice, issues of social justice, which is a phrase that wasn't, when we were in college, I don't know, we used that phrase, right? And so I think there are ways in which, you know, one might talk about social justice uh, around works of art and, and how it informs that perspective. Those are the kinds of books the, that younger generation, my teenager, that's what they want to read, that's what they want to talk about, that's what they want to engage. Um, and so maybe that's maybe a more useful term for thinking about what I'm doing. This is a book, a social justice book or something, you know. Um, but I did just get an email today, you know, about the fight in California to um, for restitution for the women in the, the state prisons who were sterilized there. And so while we, we may feel that forced sterilization is not debatable, it is in the sense that how does it keep happening? Yeah. Because we right. have these vulnerable populations, right. right? And it's still on the, you know, Buck v. Bell, the 1927 U.S. Supreme Court decision, which said that these federal institutions could mm. sterilize people who were mentally ill mm. is still the law of the land. That decision was clarified in further rulings, but it was never overturned. Mm. And so, um, you know, that you know, I heard someone say that like it's very difficult for people to fight for rights they think they have. Right. When you know mm. we think we have this right, right. to control our bodies. But the most vulnerable members of our population often don't. And that is, and as long as they're in jeopardy, so are we. Uh, hi, Dolan. Hi. Um, my name is Mia. We don't know each other. Okay. Um, but I was in D.C. I know. It's so hard to tell with the mask I know, on. I'm I know, like, right? And the light. <laughs> but I was in D.C. this past weekend, so. Okay. Or something. Um, thank you for coming. Just um, one of the things that you said made me think as a mother. So you researched this family and their story. And I mean, we can woulda, coulda, shoulda all day long mm -hmm. about what 
we could have done to change the outcomes. <clears throat> but like as a mother of a 15 year old as well, <laughs> um, <laughs> there were times when my voice um, was there to protect her and to um, advocate for her and to fight for her. And now, because her little body goes in places that I'm not always there, she has to do that for herself. So my question to you is, knowing the stories of the girls, what's something that you think could have been done to drastically change the outcome for this family? And, and, and when I say that, being mindful of the times we're living in now, how just how can a young woman or a mother, just whatever comes to you, mm -hmm. I just, because you know the history, I'm just curious of what do you think could have been done to change the outcome? You know, sadly, there was at that time a war on black women's bodies, on the bodies of black women and girls. It was very difficult for Joe Levin to fight that case. Um, he fought that case in Washington, D.C.'s federal court. And in, and in my book, it's in Montgomery, but in real life, he took it in federal court in Washington, and it was against the U.S. government. It was a class action suit against the U.S. government, specifically the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, and that department, who knew that they needed to be regulating these federal clinics, but never sent them the guidelines, never sent the guidelines to the clinics. So I think it was a very difficult machine that, that actual, the real life family was up against. And they had a fabulous social worker in Mrs. Bly. She was caring for those girls. She cared for all of her, um, the kids and families that she worked with. And she still couldn't stop it, you know? So I don't know what could have been done in that actual case. Um, in a general sense, I will just say that as long as the most vulnerable members of our society are at risk, and I think this is something that we need to think about when Roe v. Wade is overturned, we all are at risk, right? As long as there aren't more black women in the health professions, um, it's possible that our health concerns won't be taken seriously, and that puts us at risk. Um, so I think, you know, the best thing for us to do is to pay attention to if there are community meetings about issues of reproductive justice. There's a whole list of reproductive justice organizations in um, my uh, book club kit that's going to be posted somewhere, I don't know where, maybe on my <laughs> website, I don't know where that thing is. But um, get involved with reproductive justice organizations because one of the parts of reproductive justice is the right to raise our children in a safe and healthy environment. Reproductive justice, a term coined by black women in the early 90s, isn't just about abortion, isn't just about birth control, it's also about the right to raise healthy children in a safe environment. And those are the issues that face mothers all over this country. And if we want to, to help our kids or the kids of you know, other families, we have to get involved in those organizations. We have to be more activist. We have to speak out more. Um, there's just always more work to be done. It's not everybody's fight. Everybody has their, everybody has their fight. And mm -hmm. so maybe it's not your fight personally. Maybe, you have, maybe you're engaged in something else. But for those people who are looking for a worthy cause to get involved with, this, this is absolutely worthy because we're talking about our kids. You know, what's more worthy than them? Um. So thank you all for joining us and thank you for your questions. 
Um, Professor Valdez will be out to sign books in a little while. Um, and have a great night. Thank you.